Quiet, please. Quiet, please. This is our final recreation for this season, written by Willis Cooper, directed by Chuck and Megan Mara, and featuring Chuck Mara. Today's story is called The Ticket Taker. I don't know where I am now. I've been wandering around for so long, I don't know where I am. All by myself. Nobody seems to know me. It's awful. One thing I know for sure is that one of these days, I'll run into him. And then it'll all be over. I keep listening for him. Every place I go. I keep listening for that jingling and his shuffling footsteps and that whiny voice of his. And I know I won't be ready for him when I do hear him. You know, you're never ready for the the guy with the bad news. And he is bad news. I thought I heard somebody knocking at the door. Did you hear it? Listen. Wait a minute. I have to be sure. (laughs) Nobody there. Guess I'm hearing things. Don't mind me. I'm always listening for him. Did you ever do that? Well, then you know then. You get to hearing things. A lot of things. Most things you don't want to hear. Jock used to talk about hearing things at night. Jock was a Scotchman, and he used to say Scotchmen can hear things that other people couldn't. (laughs) That guy could tell you stories that make your hair curl. I wish I hadn't listened to so many of them, because there was a thing he used to say. I can't do that Scottish dialect, but it was about witches and warlocks and things that gang bump in the nest. (laughs) Things that gang bump in the neck. I got my share of them, brother. I listen for them. Jock, Ruby, and me, sitting at the room in the house on Taylor Street in Chicago, sitting there all day long with the window shades down, and $22,418 there on the table. Sitting there all night long with... One of us always awake with a rifle leaning against the windowsill. I'd wake up at two o'clock in the morning and it would be Ruby counting the money again. In the little red glow that came in the window from the neon light in the saloon across the street. I'd wake up at five o'clock in the morning and it'd be Jacques' footsteps across the floor and him singing an old Scottish song to himself. Lasses a Lilton before dawn or day. Now there's a moaning on Ilka Green Moaning. Flowers over the forest are a weed away. Shut up, will ya? Oh, did I wake up, Bernie? Sorry, was not thinking. <laughs> did you get any sleep then? I slept for a while. Todd, it's hot. <laughs> See anybody? Well, there was a lad stooped outside about three hours ago, but he was waiting for a woman. <laughs> I listened to him talking. Uh, sun's up. Gonna be another hot day. What time is it, Jock? <sighs> Five. Wake up, Ruby. I'm awake. How could anybody sleep with that bellerin? <sighs> Any water left? Not some uncle. I got thirsty in the nicht. You sure must have. Don't drink it all. All right. What day is this? Friday. Give me the water. Friday. We've been here eight days. Nine. Yeah, nine. Go downstairs, Ruby, and see if the old lady's got coffee ready. Oh, and tell her to get the papers. Yeah, have her get the papers, too. They won't be out yet. Well, tell her to get them. I want to get out of here. Don't we all? Maybe this will be the day. Don't get carried away. When I leave... 
I want to leave for good. Go ahead, Ruby. All right. How much longer you think, Ernie? Not much, I hope. Well, they got Dee Dee in jail. They can't hold him. You know they haven't got anything on him. If I was Dee Dee, I'd want to stay in jail. <laughs> Me too. Keep your eye out the window. Nobody. I think we're getting away with it, Ernie. We'll see. <sighs> Boy, I'm hot. Hot in more ways than one, laddie. <laughs> hot in more ways than one. That's a bad joke. A strictly no good joke, but it's true. We are hot, hotter than a two dollar pistol. Frank Gaffney died yesterday at the Pasadena Hospital with a row of bullet holes across his belly you could see through. And if Frank's boys ever find out who did it, somebody's gonna die the hard way. Those Irish lads from the back of the yards are tough monkeys, friend. But it's a laugh. Everybody knows Dee Dee Brandis was Frank's worst enemy. Dee Dee shot off his mouth a lot of times about making Undertaker bait out of Frank. Dee Dee oughtn't to drink so much. So what happens? Frank gets a row of 45 caliber kisses across the front porch and boom, everybody hollers Dee Dee. Even the cops go for it. And before you can say Jack Robinson, Dee Dee's in the can. And Frankie's boys are looping and polishing cannons for Dee Dee when he gets out because he'll get out, see? And nobody can prove anything. Except he was Frank's worst enemy. And that's bad, especially when nobody saw Frank get embroidered. And all the time, we're sitting in this room on Taylor Street with the shades down and nobody knows we're in town. And we got $22,418 on the table. And all we got to do is wait. Wait till the cops toss Dee Dee out of the clink. Wait till the Lugans from back of the yards catch up with Dee Dee and give him that old Chicago farewell. We didn't even know Frank Gaffney. Old lady that sells flowers put the big fat finger on him for us. Funny how flowers and mob killings get mixed up together in Chicago, ain't it? You remember Dini O'Banion? Had that flower shop uh, across from Holy Name? They mowed him down among his sweet peas a long time ago. I guess Frank Gaffney got flowers from old Dean's shop. Anyway, you can see it's a sweet deal if we can hold out till Dee Dee gets paid off for something he did not do. The Lugans will be satisfied and they'll put their artillery away and figure it's a deal. And Ruby and Jock and me will take a very, very quiet powder with our 22,418 bucks and everybody will be happy. The guys that paid us for the job, the cops, Frankie's mob, and us, we'll be happy. You could turn us into a banana. The door busted open. Hey, I got the papers. You come awful close to getting a slug right through your thrap and scalp of the door as you do. Shut the door, you jerk. Look at the papers. Let's see. Well. <laughs> Goodbye, Dee Dee. Let me see. <laughs> Will. Knocked him off half an hour after the cops turned him loose. Leland and Damon Avenue. <laughs> it was a long way from home, Ernie, wasn't they? Those gafty lads are everywhere, Ruby. They're back home, they knew, though. What? The job's done. They're finishing up a good next sleep. When do we get out of here, Ernie? Any minute. Today? We'll just wait a couple of days. Just to be on the safe side. Ernie! I can't take it here anymore. <laughs> you took it for nine days, no, Ruby. One more day when I hurt you. Jock's right, Ruby. We don't want to take any chances we don't have to. I want to get out of here. Shut up and let us read the papers. We'll be out soon enough. Maybe we could put the window curtain up now, huh? No. We're clean, Jock. We'll be clean when we're well out of here, Ruby. Go count the money again. Yes. Go count the money again, Ruby. We'll be using money pretty soon now. Pretty soon, it won't be just pieces of colored paper. It'll be money again. Money to turn into drinks and good times. 
Count the money, Ruby. While we read how they found Dee Dee Brandis under a tree in front of the jeweler's house on the north side, and Dee Dee's blood was what turned it into money again. And then there's a talking to do in the hot room on Taylor Street after the papers were read. We want to leave town quietly. We don't want to annoy anybody. We don't want to attract any attention. The guns of the Gaffney mob talk awful loud. And while the Lugans are sure that their bill is paid now that Dee is on his back in the cold room, we still have to remember the boys that got the money up for us. One crack in a Wabash Avenue tavern, and it could be our turn, see? So, like Jock says, we're between the devil and a deep blue scene. We got a blow, but we got to take it easy. And if I never see Chicago again, it'll be okay. So we cut the cards to see who goes first. Fada clubs. Jack of diamonds. <laughs> Queen of spades. And it's Ruby. Ruby's gonna go first. Jack and I look at each other, and Ruby doesn't see us. Ruby can go first. Ruby can be the eager beaver. Ruby can be the guinea pig. <laughs> Me? I don't mind waiting another day or two. If Ruby makes the grade, all right. And if she doesn't, you'll see what I mean. She was in a hurry. So now it's night. And Ruby's counted the money for the last time. And we split it three ways. And we matched for the extra two dollars where it didn't come out even. And Ruby won. And she felt fine. It was nine o'clock. And it wasn't dark yet. And it was ten o'clock. And there was still some people walking along Taylor Street. And it was 11 and midnight. And a copper walked past. And it was 2 o'clock in the morning when we opened the door and started downstairs. Sure. All three of us. Wasn't very smart of us, I suppose. When you figure how we'd hid out there in that old house for so long just to be sure we'd get away alive. But talking makes people cocky sometimes. We figured we needed some air. And it wouldn't be right to let a pal walk out alone. Besides, it was only over to the Garfield Park L station at Halstead Street for Jock and me, and Ruby was going to take the L there and ride out to Cicero Avenue and grab a streetcar south to the airport. I'll get off a couple blocks this side of the airport so that I can kind of case if they should be anybody hanging around. There won't be anybody, Ruby. You're all set now, Ruby? Yes, sir. I'll be on old flight 20 at 410, and by the time you guys wake up, I'll be in New York. Man. And you'll meet us at Ted's place next Thursday afternoon. Oh, boy. New York. And see you don't go getting lost. I've never been on an airplane before. I hope it don't crack up. Well, don't forget the name you're using either. Ms. Masterson, Miss J.P. Masterson of Des Moines, Iowa. <laughs> Hope nobody ever asked me about Des Moines. I have never been there. Didn't talk so much, Mrs. Masterson. I'm happy, Jock. Tell us that in New York, Lassie. What's the matter with you? Wait. Stop. What's the matter? Over here in the shadow. What's the matter? Somebody following us. You're crazy. Shut up. Over here in the doorway. Quick. An old factory building with deep doorways. Three of us huddled in the thick, wet darkness and sweat starting under my arms again. A streetlight half a block away gleamed a second on Jock's revolver. And the only sound in the thick, sticky night was a lonesome whistle of a lake dredge crying for the Michigan Avenue Bridge three miles away. And then we heard a sound. There was someone following us. Right out of the shadows he came. And now I can never forget the sound of his shuffling footsteps and the jingle of the stuff he carried. A harmless old man in a broken cap and a long overcoat that trailed the ground. Chicago weather in midsummer and a heavy overcoat buttoned up to his scrawny neck. Padded along the heat and the darkness. And the three of us hiding from him in the doorway, we felt like fools and we waited for him to pass. He didn't pass us, though. Straight 
through the shadowy doorway the old man came. I was sure he couldn't see us in the dark, but those vacant eyes he turned toward us were sharper than I thought. And I thought, too, that I felt a breath of cold air as he stopped, wagging his ancient head from side to side. I thought, too, of the warlocks and witches and things that go bump in the night that Jack was always going on about as the old man winded us. One of you going on the elevated. How did he know that? I know one of you's going on the elevated. Who was he? How did he know? Was he... What do you want, old man? You're not the one going on the elevated, sir. Here, old man. Here's a quarter. Go home and go to bed. I can't, sir. I've got work to do. This isn't the one either. He was looking at me, ignoring the two bits that Jacques held down to him. You're the one. Who, me? I'll have your ticket, if you please, ma'am. Ticket? What, what ticket? Your ticket, please. I haven't got any ticket, old man. You don't buy tickets on the elevated. You've got the ticket, ma'am. You have to have a ticket. Listen, old man, I'll tell you. Beat it, Ruby. Here comes the train. There won't be another for an hour. Oh, okay. So long, guys. I'll have to have your ticket, ma'am. Get out of here, old man. I haven't got a ticket. What are you, nuts? You've got a ticket, ma'am. Look in your pockets. I have to have your ticket. Get out of the way. In your right-hand pocket, ma'am. I tell you... I'll be a son... That's it, ma'am. Thank you very much. Now I'll just punch it for you. So it's all right. You can go now, ma'am. Be a quick, Ruby. We'll take care of the old fool. Good luck, kid. Look, I, I don't know where that ticket came from. Be a... You missed the train. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, see you Thursday. So long, Ernie. So long, Jock. <sighs> well, she's gone. Now, old man. Hey, old man. Ernie. Where'd he go? There wasn't any old man. Jacques and I stood there on the deserted street all by ourselves, with the roar of the L train easing away westward in the early morning with Ruby on her way home. There wasn't anybody there but the two of us. There was a bakery wagon two blocks down the street. There was a girl coming down the steps of the elevated station. And the L train banging its way westward blocks away. That's all. I noticed the way Jock glanced at me as we passed under a streetlight. I was looking at him the same way. We didn't say a word to each other all the way back to Taylor Street. I guess we were both thinking the same thing. Maybe Ruby was going to be the guinea pig. Maybe the old guy was one of the Gaffney mob. Maybe they hadn't been satisfied with knocking off Dee Dee. How did the old guy know that one of us was going someplace in the elevated? How did he know which was the right one? We stole quite a while before we went up to the room. I'm not yelling, neither is Jock, but neither of us wanted to be the first one to go into that room. We crawled down the hallway on our hands and knees and I reached up in the dark and unlocked the door. We stayed down on the floor so as not to make a good target. We didn't need to go through all that routine. (laughs) There wasn't anybody in the room. We didn't sleep. Jock sat by the window with a sawed-off shotgun and after a while he said, If that was putting the finger on Ruby, it was awful well done, Ernie. I didn't see anybody around. Oh, Frank Gaffney didn't see anybody at home when the old lady put the finger on him for us. We got the news when the papers came. We heard the kids down the street hollering, Extra! And Jock and I looked at each other without saying anything. You know what we thought. We thought the headlines would be something like Gaffney mob blast gunmen with Ruby's picture on the front page. But that wasn't the headline. The big story was about an airliner that crashed on a takeoff at Municipal Airport at 4.10. Everybody on board was killed, and the name at the head of the passenger list was J.P. Masterson of Des Moines, Iowa. Did you hear somebody walking? Listen a minute. I guess it wasn't. But I've got the jitters now that I'm all alone, after everything that's happened. I hear things all the time. Sure, I'm alone. No, Jacques... Didn't I tell you about Jacques? Oh. 
I remember I was talking about Ruby and the plane crash. Well, Jacques and I decided that the old man wasn't one of the Gaffney boys. He couldn't be. How could a crazy old man have anything to do with an airplane crash? That ain't possible, is it? But who was he? And what was that ticket that Ruby had? I had a sworn that Ruby didn't have any ticket except the plane ticket. We each had plane tickets. That was part of the deal, you see? All we had to do was call up and make our reservations whenever we wanted to get out of town. That's all the tickets we had. Jock and I got to talking about a couple days later. Well, I didn't care who the old man was. Neither what he had to do with it all. But it's warning enough for me, Ernie. What are you going to do? Look, laddie. The plane ticket didn't cost me anything, you see? And regardless of whether the old man had anything to do with it, I'm not going to ride in no airplane for nobody. Yes, but... I'm going to take a bus to New York. A bus? Jacques? Ach, aye. A bus. I'll save myself a few dollars, and it's only overnight, and nobody ever heard of a bus cracking up and fire. And when I get to New York, I'll cash in the plane ticket, and I'll be a few dollars ahead. You come and go with me. I was going to take the train. Listen, Ernie. I did not care whether Frank Gaffney's lines are on to us or not. But when they are, they'd be more likely to hang about at railway stations than a Buddha bus terminal. Do you see? I think you got something there, Jacques. I, I have. And another thing, Ernie. There'll be no nonsense about tickets on bus, too. I wish I knew what that old guy... Forget the old guy. I wish I could forget him. I wish I could forget him right now. I've had all I want of him, the ticket taker. Who is he? What are those tickets? Hmm. Let me tell you about Jock and me. We went down to the bus terminal. There was a bus for New York at 8.30. I remember what I did. I gave Jock all my share of the money, except for a couple hundred dollars. We were gonna be together on the bus and he had a money belt. I wish I had some of that dough now. I could use it, I guess. Well, we're standing around the bus station down on Wabash Avenue, waiting for the fella to call ours. We were standing there, waiting and listening. sudden there was one of those silences and I heard something I did not hear anything listen Jacques uh, I hear it you see him I don't see anybody may I have your ticket sir where did you come from I came for your ticket sir my bus ticket your ticket please I haven't got very long to wait I haven't got anything but my bus ticket yes you have Look in your pocket. Who are you, old man? I want his ticket. He hasn't got any ticket. Yes, he has. I haven't. In your pocket. I tell you what. That's it. That's it. Thank you. I wish you a very pleasant journey, sir. Now, wait a minute. I want to know who you are. And I... Ernie. What? Goodbye, old man. Listen, Jock. I'm going to find out about this. Shut up. Let him go. But I... Where'd he go? Never mind where he went. Listen. He scrammed into the crowd. Let him go. We're gonna top the old boy this time. What are we? Listen. I think he knows what bus we're going on. I'm gonna go switch our tickets real fast and we'll take the next one, see? Walk out and buy some cigarettes or something while I go get the tickets changed. While he's watching you. Go, go on, be here. Meet me here in five minutes. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. But Jacques has got a good idea, so I'll try it. He goes to the ticket window, and I ease my way through the door, out onto the street. I duck into a cigar store. We'll cross up this phony ticket taker, won't we? How did he arrange that airplane crack-up, I wonder? Well, he won't get Jock and me. I come out. I don't see him anywhere. Is he watching Jacques, I wonder? Where did Jacques go? For a second, I'm turned around. Jacques, where'd you go? It's silly to yell that way. What? 
Where'd you come from? I was watching your friend. Where is he? He's gone. What? He's gone, friend. Did he run out on me with all that money? Oh, no. Well, where is he? You wouldn't want to see him now, friend. He had an accident. He had a what? He fell in front of the bus over there. I'm afraid he's dead. You? What are you telling me? Oh, it's quite all right. You know, I have his ticket. Did you? Did you? That gun won't do you any good, friend. You killed him. Oh, no. You killed him, I tell you. Put up the gun, friend. I shot him. I shot him right through the chest. Twice. I wasn't six inches from him. I couldn't miss at that distance. But I... I figured if he was one of the Gaffney mobs, he was going to get me anyway, so I'd go out with a bang. Right through the chest, I shot him. And you know what? He wasn't there at all. There wasn't anybody there at all, except a copper from Harrison Street, staring at me as though I was nuts. What are you shooting at, bud? That old man. I, I got him. What old man? The, the ticket taker. He killed my friend. He's one of the Gavney mob. What old man are you talking about? I... Where is he? Are you crazy or something, bud? Shooting holes in a brick wall? He was right here. There ain't nobody there. Hand me that gun. He got away. Listen, cop. I'll have that gun, bud. All right, you people. Move on. Come on, bud. It's 30 days for shooting off guns in public places. Well, you might have hurt somebody. 30 days. And they laughed at me when they let me out. Am I crazy? I don't know. I... I... <laughs> I keep hearing things. I know he was there when I shot, but... Listen. Do you hear anything? I do. Don't tell me I'm nutty. Listen. Listen. It's him. It's him, you hear me? That's the ticket taker. But he's not gonna get me. Oh, you have to have a ticket to get knocked off. And I haven't got a ticket. I'm not gonna answer it. You're not gonna get me, old man. I haven't got a ticket. I'm not gonna answer it. There isn't anybody there. Do you see? Do you see? There isn't anybody there. There isn't any ticket taker. I've been dreaming. All the time I've been dreaming. What's that? Under the door. What? What is that? What is this? What is this? I left your ticket for you, mister. You will be needing it. One of these days. You have listened to Quiet, Please, which is written by Willis Cooper and directed by Chuck and Megan Mara. The person who spoke to you was Chuck Mara. And Anton Prather was the ticket taker. The others were Margot Moreau, who played Ruby, Todd Gaidishek, who is Jacques, and the policeman, William Attaway. This episode of Quiet, Please was originally broadcast on June 29th, 1947 by the Mutual Broadcasting Company. Until next time, I am quietly yours, Chuck Mara. Quiet Please comes to you from Los Angeles and is produced by Foley Mara Studios. 